with meaning. Let's just say it's, it's, it's well, I think it, I think it is. I think that, 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 that connectedness with what is that affords transformation is what people are even talking about in the psychological literature, ultimately about meaning. Yeah. So two things come up then to tie back to previous things, right? That the, the, the discussion of the origin, I think resonates with the discussion we were having about tradition. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then I think, I think of the enlightenment, in, right? And the enlightenment's rejection of tradition as an oppressive, it, it's a Gnostic attitude, right? It's a, in the pejorative sense of Gnostic, the, re, the rejection of, of tradition as an oppressive structure, right? That is keeping us, uh, you know, from um, uh, the promised future or something like that. And then I think that is bound up with what we were also discussing, this truncation of rationality uh, down to basically monologic inferential argumentation and losing the connection with ratio and logos. Those two things seem to be coming to me together at sort of a historical moment in the Enlightenment. Hmm. Hmm. And, and that's pertinent to me because uh, we have people, uh, obviously the person that comes to mind is Steven Pinker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically saying Enlightenment now, right? The, the, <laughs> The, the problem, the doubling down, right? The, 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 the idea, the problem is we, we, we're, just, we're just not accepting how really, really wonderful the Enlightenment is. And, and again, to be Heideggerian about this is to, is to not deny, seriously to not deny everything the Enlightenment has given us, right? And I, I, you know, science is an, is an important thing. I'm a scientist. I value it. Um, uh, you know, the increase in, in healthcare, that, that is not a minor thing in human existence, etc. So not, and, so, and he puts up all of his graphs and there's no, there, there's no denying the, well, actually some of the graphs I think are controversial, but we, yeah. there's no denying most of the graphs, but that's, yeah. Yeah. but there's a sense in which the graphs for all, all the ways in which they're graphic, they miss the point. They miss the point of what the, like how the enlightenment, again, cut us off from ratio and cut us off from tradition and in that significant deep way cut mm. us off from a cultural cognitive grammar for falling in love with being uh, yes <laughs> yeah it's yeah it's so you know to make a heideggerian point of full agreement it, it the, the trouble is and enlightenment forgets darkness concealment and yes and, forget and the horror Right? Yes. It, and it, it forgets it, that part of the sacred is the horror. Yeah. If, but, you, if, you, if you're not open to horror, you're closed off to awe. And if you're closed off to awe, you wonder differs from curiosity in that wonder yeah. calls everything into question. Yeah. But, but yes. And, and on, on top of that, you could say horror comes back to haunt you. Yes. On a different level and more fundamental. And then you're no longer even capable of dealing with it because you, you're not used to it being there, being part or at the heart of existence you could say what why is death so so extremely outsourced or denied yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in our in our epoch mm -hmm. it's you know, norbert yeah. Elias spoke about the, uh, the 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 loneliness of the dying this is a tremendous societal problem um but death itself what is it for the greeks for for the greeks death is at the heart or the is an irresolvable mystery or problem at the heart of 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 existence but for us today, it's according to Harari, just a technical problem waiting to be solved, mm -hmm. right? And and I think maybe Pinker would be in agreement with Harari here. I don't know, but when I, I don't know if you, if you might know John Gray, uh, in in, he's a British philosopher, uh, and in one of his books, I think the Soul of the Marionette, which is a reference to Heinrich von Kleist, he says that what he sees with this new Enlightenment movement by people like Richard Dawkins and Pinker and others. Mm. is that what, what, what's the world they want to live in? Do they want to live as in the machine stops in a, in a bunker somewhere looking at graphs where they get new, a news feed every day, how much better the world is? And in terms of, oh, look, it's all going, moving upwards. But what, what's hidden in these graphs is that even if we've got all the best healthcare and, and people live longer, et cetera, the, the intricacies, the, prop, the, the existential problems of being a human being don't go away. They, they don't just disappear. Yeah, They're yeah. still, right? Yeah. You, you still have to die. You still face all the horror that everyone else has faced. Um, and, and 
hopefully not as bad as some some have had to go through but still this is not it, it forgets darkness this enlightenment uh movement but it it, it brings back another kind of darkness, right? If, if you keep staring at the sun, the sun will turn dark, you will turn blind. You can't just be in sheer light all the time. Yes, yes, I agree with that. Yeah. I think that was very, very well said. Yeah. It, it strikes me even if we move to the sort of popular culture, because uh, I talk about this in, in yeah. the course, I talk about how, even in, in my class, how, in fact, even many of the movies we call horror movies are not horror movies. They're just, you know, they're just, I call them startled and puncture movies. They're just movies that are designed to give us more and more intense experiences of our fear of predation. We're wired to be afraid of predators because we, you know, are, you know, all of the previous, we, we were preyed on for a very long time. So that's yeah. deep in us. So we can push that button just like you can push, you know, the, 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 the glucose button and people will gorge on sugar and they will gorge on the fear of predation. Uh, but there's very few movies that actually give you, like, there should be something that's on the same scale. There should be an aspect of wonder in horror. Like in wonder, you call yourself and your grip on reality, right, into question. And horror should be like where you and your sense of self and your sense of your grip on things is called radically into question. Now, there are some, I found there are a few, there are a couple of movies that do do that. They try to do horror. But I think it bespeaks the point we're talking about that popular culture actually also, and this is such a Heideggerian thing, eh? it hides horror under the mask of what it calls horror. It actually prevents us from encountering yeah. horror yeah. by yeah. putting it in, like, this mask on front of it, which makes it basically a monster to be killed, right? Yeah. Yeah. right? All you have to do is actually, if you can just face your fear of predation and turn and face the monster, yeah, da 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 da, right, kind of thing. Yeah. Whereas, no, right? Horror should should leave you with a a mystery that undermines your sense of you know ultimate security. That's part of what uh, horror should do for you. It should it should be like it should have an as in my to my mind. It should have uh, aspects. I mean, it, it is just psychologically. It's on a continuum with awe and wonder. And, and um, yes, yeah, so it's something. Yeah, there's something you said about about. Um, like bringing in a contemporary culture, right? Of yeah, yeah. Where, it's like, where is it? And this is one of the things I'm, I think I'm getting more of a sense of, okay, hmm. to, to relate with, to, to, to look for the place that where we can genuinely find the horror, right? Yeah. right. Is, uh, is yeah. the sense is what, what, what's really interesting is that, yeah. um, and this is one of the things about the, the, uh, this notion of like the tech, the age of technology, right? Is, is that, for example, when I go to, um, actually I was in Atlanta visiting my mom, she lives in Atlanta and we went to this, um, this temple that they had actually shipped over block by block, um, from India. And it was a, it was a, uh, like a, a like a, a Hindu temple, like to the oh, max, right? Yeah. And I remember I went in there and the whole thing, every single part of it was carved and animated and told a story. And I didn't even know what the story was. I couldn't understand it, but like you just, it communicated just this deep sense of this ever infractaling sense of yeah. recognition of being nothing, everything like, do you get to the, you get to the center of the thing, you look up and there's this, like, it goes into <laughs> It's just like you're, you know, you're walking out and you're just like present, man, like vibrating it. And then we walked back out and I looked up and I looked across the street and there's this, like, there's this shopping center, right? <laughs> and there's just the people walking along and like this awful, this <laughs> awful road, right? With, it, and I just, I, I was so struck and horrified. But here's the thing that's like, here's the thing that seems horrifying. It's, it's, not, it's not that we live in places like that and that they exist. It's that, and that they're horrifying. The horror is that everybody's walking around and nobody is saying this is horrible, right? There's very few people that are walking around. They're just, 
in the flow of it, but there, as, as you look like at these, these houses that are the same, just a little bit of difference, like yeah. buildings are built to look like something, right? Versus being something, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's a, that's where I feel a particular, it, the, thing, the thing that is horrifying and fascinating, and I'm wondering if this is like an example of starting to actually look at the withdrawal, right? Seeing the withdrawal and being in relationship to it, is it seems like part of the withdrawal is no one is noticing the withdrawal, right? Isn't that? Well, well yeah, Nietzsche says in the genealogy of morality, yeah. and all, he, speak, he also speaks of the horror of acqui, so the sheer horror of emptiness, and he says, rather than not willing, the will wants nothing, right? right? So I just, I, I'd rather become a great destroyer. Yeah, yeah, Fromm said that too, right? When, yeah. when, when people can't make anything, they, rather than doing nothing, they'd rather smash everything down because at least, yeah. at least they, they, they've got the last vestiges of, of their agency. Yeah. So, so I, I, I'm wondering what, about what Guy just said. I, 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 there's a sense in which people, and I mean, that was part of the whole book that I wrote with Chris and Philip, right? The zombie. The zombie is, is, the, is the being that is completely unaware of the fact that it's a zombie, that yeah. is disconnected from the world, from itself, from its... The zombie is all of the disconnections unaware of yeah. the disconnections, and, and, and it's a symbol. But, you know, uh, Leo and Anderson and I, we reviewed a couple of movies on the week uh, for, that are going to come out in the Minding Media series. Joker, in which you see a shift uh, from the zombie to something worse, and it, 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 it goes to the point we just spoke about. Where now, of course, the Joker, spoilers here, by the way, spoilers. Uh, Joker is about the meaning crisis. I think that's very clear because, you know, all of the tropes of meaning, you know, his connection to his past is undermined. If the very story that we're watching, we lose any sense of dramatic irony because we don't know what's real and not in it, right? His name is oxymoronic. He's Arthur, the great king, Fleck. A meaningless, a, meaningless, a meaningless piece of crap, you know, Arthur Fleck, like, you know, come, like, we're, just, we're, getting, we're getting pounded over the head. And then we see him sort of devolve into all he wants is whatever kind of attention is left, right? That's all, he, he, right? It, it, no, there's no meaning, no value, no connectedness. It's just, it's just the sheer, it's, it's even beyond, right? It's even beyond sort of destructiveness. It's just, right? Uh, the, the, you know, the, the last n narcissism is the last vestige uh, of, of, of attention. Uh, well, at least, you know, things are, people are still paying attention to me. And then what was interesting about that is, you know, the way, the way, again, what we're talking about, the, 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 instead of the shuffling zombies at the shopping mall, you have the angry crowd in riot, focused on a figure that's not a leader in any sense mm. but who what who what what he's doing is he's trying to make the environment as absurd as his own narcissism because that's the last bit of conformity that's possible for him that's the last bit of him having a connection to reality available to him right and so you i think and the fact that that movie was so like popular and got so much attention yes i people aren't talking about it and so you're right guy there's still zombies but I'm afraid that we're actually moving to something beyond them not talking about it. I think we're moving to the possibility that they might start acting out from it, not acting on it, but you know how we talk about somebody acting out, like yeah. when they're acting out, like when a child is acting out an issue that mm -hmm. it doesn't properly understand, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's how I'm trying to use that phrase because that's what Joker is, right? He's the, he's the child man that's acting out how the meaning crisis is shifting from the zombie horde to right the nar the, the the violent absurdist narcissist, yeah. and mm. and I think that's something uh, yes. to really really pay attention to. Uh, and for me, um, that that brought with it a yeah. kind of horror um, that um, goes beyond. Sorry, I'm not trying to trump you or anything, Kai. Yeah. <laughs> It yeah. goes beyond the horror of the zombie. The horror of the zombie is that vacancy, right? But the horror of Joker is a, is a different thing. It's that this is now twisting in, in a way uh, that I think is extremely dangerous, extremely dangerous. If, yeah. if, if yeah. it portends 
if it is a, if the movie isn't just a movie and is a, a myth of some kind that's emerging um, the fact that it takes place around a mythic character is also you know kind of kind of uh something thought provoking i would say this is uh, i just want to make sure i got what you're saying like that the extra the, the new loop around right which yeah. is it's not just the vacancy right of being a zombie it's that i act out of being that that vacancy and my only my, the, the thing you said about conformity is the last conformity that i have left to yeah, the last way in which i can be identical to the unfolding of being is if being is pri if, the, if the unfolding of being is primarily absurdity right and, and especially if that's how i'm participating in it because a narcissist's existence is one of enacted embodied absurdity right if then if i can if i can you know if i can make the absurdity out there as comprehensive as possible then at, then at least i have that final last ditch connect connection to things but th th this is extremely important to 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 think this through further and yeah. and, and 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 also make as many people as possible aware because i think what we're pushing against is 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 you can call it late modern subjectivity hyper modern subjectivity exactly whatever. exactly it's, it's subjectivity collapsing into itself yes. and it's it's this it's, it's 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 becoming paranoid you can yeah. see how it's losing its grip on reality how it's losing its sense of certainty that we that it was given by descartes and others right exactly. absolute sense of certainty is now collapsing and all i'm left with is as you said is this absurdity is being unfolding as absurd and now all i can do to make sense of anything or posit myself again is by acts of sheer and utter brutal violence for example yes exactly that, that just bring my horror that i can't cope with because the world isn't supposed to be horrible but somehow it's completely absurd i bring this horror into the world and i assert myself with it and give myself some certainty before i ultimately collapse what i see in all of the madness is subjectivity pushing to its utmost limit at the moment exactly i think that was beautifully said i think that i think that I think that uh, developed my point very well. I, I, I really like what you just said. I think that's, I think that's an, uh, that's a, that dimension you added is insightful. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And it's interesting. It's kind of like there is this, there was a sense of that movie actually, right? As everyone gathered along, that it looked very much like some of the, some of the, um, the protests at Berkeley. Right. Like I remember walking out one time, I, I used to live right across the street from Berkeley, like the main, the main campus. And I, um, we had a meeting and helicopters were going and you're hearing noises and there's riots. And, and it was just, I don't know, it was like Ben Shapiro or something speaking. Right. Yeah. And I, you walk outside and there was literally uh, um, the, the hammer and sickle spray painted on all the buildings. Mm -hmm. And it was this, um, it's interesting because I'm thinking about this sense of like, it was it, it, like, it was a very moral stance. Like, how could you have this, whatever, whatever the assertion was about that person. But it was like uncanny. It was eerie walking out in, mm -hmm. in the streets afterwards. And um, yet it was very tied to a morality, weirdly enough. And I'm, and I'm just, I'm just, it's tied yeah, to morality as, that when we at the end of that movie when everyone was like rah right like there's totally no morality there's no yeah. there's not tied to anything yeah and I mean and the thing is I mean I don't want to get into the politics of this yeah yeah totally so there is but but there is there is the collapsing of morality to the assertion uh, of, of of rules and propositions right. so morality in those kinds of protests has been divested from virtue um it, it, like it's been disconnected from virtue in uh, in some really really important ways that needs to be talked about again uh, i don't i i don't want to claim that people within a democracy shouldn't protest obviously yeah. they should etc i'm not i'm clearly not saying that but what i'm i'm talking about the content in which the protest is expressed not the fact 
or the goal of the protest, okay? Yeah. So let's be clear yeah. about that. I'm not talking about the fact or the goal of protest. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the content in which it expressed and whether or not that expression actually sits well with the fact and the goals of protest. Yeah. I mean, it claims to be, it makes moral claims, but when you, when you separate morality, I think, from virtue, especially the, virtue, the virtues of wisdom and courage, right, and sophrison, uh, then the, your protestations, literally, about justice are going to be very hollow um, in, in, in an important sense that we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so I see that as actually what you get sort of before you get what you see in Joker, which yeah. is what you're pointing to. You get the, pro the protest that is just protest. Yeah. It, 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 it serves absolutely, it's not even, it's, not even a, it's, it's even given up the pretense of virtue signaling or, or making moral assertions. It's just smashing and anger and let's just let's make everything let's just let's just break apart uh, whatever structures are left because structure itself intelligibility itself has now become oppressive to us yeah i agree with that i agree i think that's 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 right hmm. now now you see where we are we're in the ha we're in the depths of the meaning crisis we're in the depths yeah. of talking about the meaning crisis yeah 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 do you think as a question on that that intelligibility has become oppressive to us. Is that, has that anything to do with what I would think of as paranoia of late modern subjectivity? I, I think so. I, I, I think that we've lost, and, and, and I, well, you could correct me on this, but I think that this is something I sort of see in Heidegger. Um, I see it also in Wittgenstein in a way, mm -hmm. um, that intelligibility is supposed to be something that gets us beyond our subjectivity that it's mm -hmm. that it is not just about what you get what, what starts to emerge right in the 11th century it's not just internal coherence amongst my my propositions right it's not just the coherence that you know that intelligibility is supposed to give me act it's supposed to get it's supposed to give me some kind of access beyond uh my subjectivity and i think when you you lose that, right? When you when you lose that sense of intelligibility that way, then of course, aren't, isn't it going to go from being like a lens through which you see? If you'll allow me this metaphor, it, it has it has some uh, bad connotations that I don't want. But if it goes through, I want to pick up on the double sense of the word through, right? Then intelligibility is something I see through, like yeah. beyond and by means of. If I if I lose the sense of seeing through, all I'm going to get is seeing looking at. And then that's a wall, yeah. right? That's a wall, right? If I can't see through, in both senses of the word through, then I'm looking at, that's a wall. And that all, all it is is just the echoing of my own su subjectivity. It's just the prison, right? It's just the prison. I think, I think that is exactly uh, what you're pointing to with what you said. And I, that, that's, how I, that's why I place so much, like I talk a lot about the transparency opacity shifting of attention and we have to remember that and then we have to somehow work that back into our understanding of understanding yeah yeah understanding of I, understanding yeah yeah because what i think is that it, just in line with that what you just said is so we look at someone like fichte right for fichte yeah. fichte says something along the lines of uh, i always recognize myself in nature he has to say that because nature is just fiction for him. Yes. You have Hegel and Schelling who try to rescue uh, nature a bit, uh, but that ha didn't really work out. And what I'm trying to say is that what, what the trajectory we're on is that the, the self-certainty of the self-asserting self-referential subject or ego has lost its certainty with the death of God, yes. most importantly. And because God, let's not forget, God is a hypothesis that Laplace no longer needs, right? Yes. Yes. God is a hypothesis that Descartes needs in order to guarantee that the world out there is actually there. It's That's his the yeah. And to make sure that actually all these people out there, they're not robots slash zombies, right? They're actually That's human right. beings. God makes sure of that, but I can't really be sure of that myself because all mm -hmm. I know is me, me, me. Um, and once this certainty disappears, once the causa sui, this ungodly, this non-godlike god just evaporates into an ever-exploding yep. non-cosmos and black holes. What we're left with is something subjectivity doesn't know and can't make sense of. So hence, it it it's as you said stuck. 
in a walled yeah. pocket yeah. itself and it yeah. reacts violently. And yes. I keep saying it because I don't want to pin it down on anyone. Right? No, no, no. Yeah. Because I think it is ultimately structural, historical. Yes. Um, yeah. but, but, but there is, to me at least, there, there, there clearly are paths out of it. And, and they have to do with what, what we talked about now. Is You could say you call it tradition, you could call it sources or, or origin or wisdom, sources of wisdom, etc. Those would be Find that those will be different paths out of it into a different way of, as you put it, an understanding of understanding mm -hmm. um, that takes us out of ourselves and into this the non propositional poetic yeah. world. Mm. Well said, well said, beautifully said. Mm. Yes, what did he just say? You well, didn't hear it. <laughs> I, 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 heard, I, I just, I, I wanted something hit you there. I want to hear about I, 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 well, I. I I got from that, I, I think I agree with the idea that, you know, Descartes represents this pivot point in which um, the, the conformity to the world be, is withdrawn until this specious moment of self-conscious conformity with itself, sort of pure subjectivity. And what Descartes needs is he needs, he needs he, he needs a, a, right, something that gives him egress, something that gives him a, a way out of that, and God is supposed to do that. And, and, but this is the God of certainty, right? This is not the God of sacredness. This is the God of cer certainty. And the problem is that God ultimately uh, evaporates, as Johannes says, and then what we get is we get trapped within um, this sub sub subjectivity. And I, I, I think it's, it's not even that it becomes opaque. I would want to add that we, it's collapsing. Uh, because if if what you're trying to find is the moment of certainty, it's vanish. It's like it's like almost like a singularity. You're vanishing and vanishing and vanishing towards it, and so the wall is closing in and closing. So rather than paranoia, Johannes, I would suggest it might be something more like existential uh, claustrophobia uh, that we're we're in, right? That we're sort of like. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what I heard. That's what I heard him saying. Yeah. It's something, it's something about like, if I just sit, if I sit with, all right, so it's like, there's a sense of like claustrophobia. I am like, I'm being closed in, right? And a rages come out, like Joker movies, like all, all of that. So if we bring in, if we bring back in, um, uh, is it Nikitashi, the guy? Nishitani. Yeah. It's funny, I just found myself going like, okay, so what is, so if that's how it's happening, this is what, how things are occurring for us, right? Yeah, yeah. If we look at it, like I just thought about this of like, okay, what would, what would he do, right? <laughs> well, and there's a sense of where I was like, oh, he would probably, I just had this sense of it would just go, and something, it would, <laughs> I like the noise. The noise is great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's something, about, there's something about, and I think this is one of the things that I, I, I like kind of in a certain sense, being right size to what's actually happening and being, mm. still being mortal and realizing on some level that we are, yep. you know, onto, like ontologically be, being is that one thing that we can never get clear on, right? Yes. But, 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 Western, Western, late modern subjectivity. We're all Fichtians. That's what I'm going to say. You know, yeah. but we're forever saying, "But I am I. I am I. Ich bin ich. Ich bin yeah. ich." Closing in. But that I know, right? Even if everything's absurd, I can still assert myself by bringing sheer horror and absurdity to a, a hypermodern hellhole. Yeah. But the other response would be, "I am mortal. I am nothing." You begin with nothing. I, I am sheer withdrawal. And all of a sudden, it could, it, 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 it could go away. That's the exercise. Because if I am nothing, it doesn't, you know, it's not a self, a nihilistic self denial and I, you know, self annihilation. I shouldn't be nothing of the sort. No, there, there isn't this core self, perhaps. Um, but there is a sense of nothingness, but in a different way that we think of it in the West, right? And, and beginning from this stance, mm -hmm. you, you, you open up again and this wall that Chong was describing this wall disappears this yeah I, I would I, I, I yeah I'm gonna say something that I think is definitely convergent with that you Nishitani would say as you move towards the center of the self you're not moving to the foundational certainty what you do is you suddenly uncover 
the mystery of the nothingness from which the self is always emerging, but never in some sort of fixed and stabilized way. And if you can get, and that, and the, like, you know, and, and I think, and I think James was getting towards this too when he made the distinction between the me and the I. The words aren't totally right, but that's what he was trying to get at. He was trying to get at when you move towards the center, you don't move to the to the fixed foundation. You actually move into the nothingness. You you move into that aspect of mystery that is is at. I, the, 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 I don't like this metaphor, but it's at the center, right? You, and so Nishitani would point to the fact that if you follow it far enough in, you find that there's no difference between moving in and moving out. That there, you find a different kind of conformity rather than the absurdity, absurdity. There's a deep conformity to, between the no thingness and the no thingness. And then that affords, right? That affords you moving back into anagoge. That's what I see him basically articulating so that if you can see the no thingness as that which affords radical transframing rather than as the privation of graspable securable actuality then you can get out of you can get out of the the the, the claustrophobia that's what i see him as saying it's because the west can only, if you'll allow me to use these two words, because the West can only represent no thingness as nothingness, that it can't make that move. And so all it does is keep, right, it gets to that point. It gets to that point. Yeah. And then we need actuality. We need actuality to come back to that. What, what, so, so what do you mean by that, Johannes? No, but the, so the self is the actual. Yes. Right? Yeah, so yeah. Rather, rather yeah. than the potential or the possible, sorry. Yeah. 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 Guy, you yeah. Say, Yes, 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 yes. No, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, yeah. I just, I'm just, I'm sensing, I'm just sensing into that kind of figure ground shift of like the. It's an aspect reversal. Yeah, it's a fundamental figure ground shift. Yes, and it's not. It's a perspectival participatory thing. It's not an argumentative thing. Yeah, you can't yeah. Get to it by argumentation. And that's argumentation, it, 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 argumentation always works within a stabilized perspective and uh, an existential mode. And we're talking about a fundamental reversal. The, the argumentation can come after and perhaps engage in explication and elucidation, but the, the process itself is not an argumentative process. Right. So it's like really like I'm wondering about just the sense of, so when I kind of just feel into it, like one thing is like I, I simultaneously go, there's some kind of risk, right? <laughs> so if the walls are coming in, there's like a risk. I, I in some way actually have to I have to almost like let go of all of Western metaphysics, <laughs> right? Like uh, there's a there's some kind of leap in there of, of, yeah. of rather than pushing away, but actually, the, whatever the experience is, I I keep getting the sense of keep watching it. No, like I'm getting the sense of meditation in, in in that sense of the word of some kind of vulnerability mm -hmm. to be with the horror. Um, and everything that we're talking about, I'm just sensing a, a certain kind of like a response is a certain kind of vulnerability. There is. I, I mean, I, I mean, within my own practice, you get to this place where you step into sort of because you, you can't grasp it. You can only be it. You can you can feel I'll use Johannes's language because it's perfectly appropriate actually for the phenomenology. You feel the perpetual withdrawal. The meditation, right? The, the perpetual withdrawal. You, you, you suddenly, it's like the back falls out from behind you. That's why I like your whoosh. Yes. Because right? like, in meditation, you're stepping back and you're stepping back and you're looking at and you're looking at. And then all of a sudden, the, the, what you're stepping back into, it like whoosh, and you get the sense of like that. That's why I like that noise that you get that sense of, uh, you know, uh, of, withdrawal which is not the sense of a thing it's not even the sense of a presence it's that i i have no other word for it it's just the phenomenological experience of the sense of withdrawal and that can be initially really really as you can imagine horrifying to people it can yeah. be very horrifying right yeah especially having got you know having had facilitated experiences of that horror that sense of like everything slipping away yeah, you should, you and then that very thing that you're just 
it's almost like the last bit of concern or care is bring on. And then at some point it goes, and then you're everywhere. <laughs> There's a sense of like, that was, that's been my experiences with those places where I've done yeah. a psychedelic or I've had an experience where it's like, Oh, like the ground starts to slip. Right. And then I can't grip onto anything in that sense of, and then there's a kind of like a, some kind of threshold of where it feels like a death of some kind, right? And a dissolving. And then th this recognition that the whole time, the thing I'm expanding into was present the whole time, <laughs> right? Somehow, like, and I just, there was some way I was standing in relationship to it or identified that had it show itself as that which was horrifying. Just that, pr that kind of process. Yeah, and I, I agree. That's uh, that sounds very similar to what, what I'm describing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So for Nishitani, that's what I mean. I mean, obviously there's argumentation in religion and nothingness, but religion and the nothingness should not be read separate from a deep kind of meditative, contemplative practice. Mm -hmm. um, just like you shouldn't read the Tao Te Ching if you're not doing Tai Chi Chuan. You're 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 you're, you're just deeply not getting it in a, in a really important sense. Um, yeah, um, that's interesting because uh, I, I, I'm interested in which people have these kinds of experiences because sometimes um, the phenomenology is one of like almost like, like I said, this whoosh. Uh, and then the other is it's, 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 <laughs> oh my gosh, it's like, it's all, it's, it's, it's not directional in the, sometimes the withdrawal feels that way, but sometimes it feels more like everything is almost holographically everything is opening up hmm. Hmm. Right. Hmm. Um, right right almost like sort of you know that you know the, no, like how Plotinus describes the one you know all the forms are reflecting and interpenetrating each other but the one is what allows for all the opening up and interpenetration that is yeah. not actually in any one of the forms and you get that <gasps> that yeah. You get that too. You, uh, that um, that that has actually become more common for me than the just just the withdrawal experience. Right, um, right. Yeah, that that sounds very familiar too. <laughs> yeah, totally. So so the point I uh, to, to get back to it, mm -hmm. um, the point Nishitani is making, of course, is of course again you don't stop doing the argumentation. I'm going to keep saying that you yeah. do. You create religion and nothingness, but you also do these perspectival participatory transformations. And then there is some kind of, allow me this metaphor, there's a, there's a dialogos between them that, and, and, and the response is in that dialogos. It's not in the text. It's not just in the meditative practice, but in the, that, that, yes. that relationship. Exactly. Yes. exactly. Exactly. Well, I, I, I started, I started meditate. I went to a Vipassana retreat, sure. right? And then I think a few months after that is when I started reading being in time. Mm. And, and it, I remember that it, after reading being time and meditating a couple hours a day, back and forth, that it, it changed my meditation, right? Yeah. There was a kind of a sense in which, yeah. Like, I expect the reverse was also the case. I expect the, the meditation afforded you seeing things in being in time that you wouldn't have otherwise seen. Right. That's what I, we, we've circled back around again about trying to get to the place of yeah. the philosopher rather than just gather their propositions. And there's, yeah. there's all these, uh, and this, is a lot, this was alive for a long time in the Neoplatonic tradition, that around the text was a whole ecology of practices and the text or the discourse yeah. And the practices were always in dialogue with each other. Yeah, this, this is what Hado brought out so beautifully. I think this was one of Hado's great points. Yes. Yeah, Hado. Hado. Yeah. Hado. Yeah. Yeah. But, but when you look at, not to make this too biographical about anyone, but uh, Heidegger had circles of students that he invited over for long, extended sessions of simply you know, thinking, and sometimes they would collapse, and sometimes they they, they wouldn't. Sometimes they were successful. Uh, and and he, uh, as you know, he worked with Medard Boss from the 50s to the late 60s, who was a Swiss psychiatrist mm. in what's now published as the Solicon Seminars. And there are still people practicing Dasein's analysis or existential therapy that came out of that. 
right, so right. Heidegger worked with psychiatrists for a decade or more until he couldn't any longer and that was his way of 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 you know of, and he provoked them right because they were totally within a cartesian framework they were very often outraged by what he said that you can't, you, you can't begin with the ego, you have to begin here, you have to begin with Dasan, and Dasan is out in the world, and it's being with others, et cetera. Um, but, he, but he never shied away from that. Um, he, he, it, it, was, it, it was about bringing it into practice. It, it wouldn't have been him to do it. Oh. It, would, it would need someone else to do it. Right, that's, right, that was right, not his right. role, and he was aware of this, because for him, this was ontic. Um, this was something that others would have to do. And, but he provided the onto ontology for that. Right, mm -hmm. his thinking, um, and it, it, yes, and it needs practice. And I, I, I see it with students too. I, I, that 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 it actually it it you know they come to university and they're they're quite enthusiastic, and after a couple of years they sound like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> rather than still having, because what I always do is first seminar, first year students, ancient Greek philosophy. Why are you here? That's my first question. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I get, is this relevant for the exam? And sometimes, <laughs> and sometimes I get my mug. Everything I say will be on the exam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. Or, 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 when I bring it, I keep bringing it back. I say, remember back the first lecture. Why did you come here? Because usually people are drawn to philosophy for a specific reason. They're looking for something. Yeah. Um, what is it that they're looking for? Well, usually they're looking for meaning. Why are they looking for meaning? And why is it that? I mean, first of all, why is it that perhaps academic philosophy doesn't really do this or doesn't acknowledge that? But, but second of all, what is it that um, can be done, should be done, must be done uh, in terms of um, providing, again, a space for these exercises, practices, etc.? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, well, the, like I, I think I mentioned this to you last time. Yeah, I'm in discussion, and I mean, Guy also knows this. You know, there are emerging communities of practice that are trying to create set ecologies of practices. But what I often find is that that's missing from them um, is, is is philosophia. Yeah. So there's a lot of the other stuff uh, around. Uh, a lot of the things that we're talking about, there's mindfulness practices and movement practices and authentic discourse practices and narrative yeah. practices and all of this. And don't get me wrong, I think this is great and I, I, and I actively work uh, to support and facilitate this. But what I often find missing is the philosophy. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And what's, 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 uh, what's interesting about that, right? Is like I'm wondering about like my, correct me if I'm a, if I'm wrong, um, but the the religion without religion, religion that's not a religion. That's my preferred way of not talking. a religion. Yeah, like I don't get the sense from from it. It's not you're not looking to build a a non-religious church or something. No, it's, I'm not trying to found a religion. I will keep saying that. Uh, yeah. the day I die. <laughs> like, like, there's a, there's and I'm wondering about if. The bringing the thing that unites all of these practices, the the theoria, the philosophy, yeah. awakening. Because yeah. to, to me, this is about like philosophy is about awakening the wonder, right? Yeah. And having that sense of things. And I find with teaching people um, that there is a sense where you have to awaken it, like in a in a yeah yeah. That's why I called it awakening from the meaning crisis. Yeah. It's a, it's, and, and it's because people aren't walking in with an awareness at all. In fact, the idea word philosophy, they, they will proactively feel that that's like assaulting or something to being in your head or something like that. So one of the things I found is, is, is it, it's like, um, and I think I've gotten better as a teacher over the years in that sense of feeling the place where you can have them see it. Yes. Yes. And then you can see that moment where like they see something, they experience something that was right in front of them their whole lives. Yeah. And it never, there's all, it never been questioned. And it's a question and you can see that awakening. Socratic right? aporia. That's really yeah. what, that's what really what Socratic aporia is supposed to do. Yeah. Right? Get you to what you thought you, what was so familiar and so obvious suddenly is now mysterious to you. 
in a profound way. I mean, that's the whole point of Socratic aporia. I agree. I, I mean, that, that's, that's why, and Johannes picked up on that, that's why I try to make a distinction between philosophy, which I think is still important, uh, by the way, um, but, but, and philosophia, uh, which I think is, um, is something more that, I'm, not, I'm, not, I, I, I'm neutral on whether or not everybody needs to do philosophy, uh, but I think everybody needs to practice and live philosophia in, in a profound way. And so um, I, I think those are, uh, those, yeah, because um, I, I guess I want, I want to pick up on that, that point you were making about, you know, you, you can bring people to that point where they get, well, it's, to use our metaphor, you get, you get a crack in the wall. Yeah. You get an opening, right? It's like the Leonard Cohen line where, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a crack in everything and that's how the light shines through, uh, right? Um, uh, really, I, I think everybody, uh, because of what we're in and where we are, I think that's why everybody ultimately needs philosophia. So while I deeply applaud and I really, and I put time and effort and talent into these emerging communities, I yeah. think there is still, right, we've got to get philosophia into them in some way. That's why this discussion is very important, by the way. That's one of the reasons, I mean, other than really liking you guys and enjoying the conversation, one of the reasons <laughs> I'm in this conversation is precisely because I want, I think it's trying to do that. It's trying to bring philosophia into this attempt to get these ecologies of practices going. Mm -hmm. Right. On, on, on this point of philosophia, perhaps also some other point, but we'll have to carve out what that is and what that means. Yes, yes, yes very but much. Yeah. One of, and you might disagree with this totally, both of you, I don't know. But one of, one of the dangers I see, and Hegel speaks of this, I think, in the Differenzschrift, um, one of, he says it, it would be absurd to call oneself a Platonist today. Mm. And, and what, I think what he means by this is that you, you can't just pick and choose. No, no. So no. you can't just go back and say, oh, I'm an Arist I'm a new, no, no, new Aristotelian, I'm an Aristotelian, I'm a Platonist, I'm a Stoic, I'm this and that, um, as if from a metaphysical supermarket. Because that's very easy to do, right? I'm going to, I'm going to be a bit of a Buddhist over here. I'm going to be this and that. But what, what does it mean that, that we have this, this rich source or origin, but also this, this, this burden of all of this knowledge? Because it, philosophy is also extremely abstract. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and well, it, it, it also is a burden to have access to all of that potential knowledge. And the question is, so if you, we use the word philosophia, to some degree, that's a going back to the Greek word, of course, right? that's the yes. yep. philosophia. Right. But how, for, for me, I think it would be extremely important to, to not be some ism, some part from this ism, no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. But, but something uniquely of this epoch, right? Un uniquely of this age that, that speaks to this age, but that, that takes, of course, direction and, and, yep. and yep. orientation yep. from the wisdom of what has been but, but doesn't sort of mix it up too much. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's, yeah, 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 it's creating, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's yeah, generating yeah. itself out of that which has been, but in such a way that responds to us, or to, or to us specifically yeah. today in our, pro yeah. 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 yeah, I totally agree with that. That's why you'll, but uh, I don't know how to articulate it. And I often thrash yeah. around with metaphors. I talk about salvaging, which is my way of trying to like, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of diving into the depths and, and bringing up what was valuable and then trying to refurbish it. Uh, uh, and it's a poor metaphor and I, I, need, I need a better one. Yeah. But that's part of what I'm trying to say when I say the religion that's not a religion. The, the reason why I think, even, for, even though I find Plato sacred and Plotinus is sacred for me too, I, I, you know, I'm not a Neoplatonist in the sense yeah. that I can't, the, the, the axial age, two worlds mythos is not viable for me. It's just not viable yeah. for mm -hmm. me. So, for, so while while I want to respond to, and I want to let the uh, I want to let the tradition flow into me, but exactly what you said, I want yeah. I, I want to I want to open to the I, I want exactly I think what you're saying. That's part of what I'm trying to put my finger on with the religion that's not a religion. Yes, it, it and picks I, up on the sacredness, but it, yeah. it's it's for now. Okay, because now now I get 
now I think I understand that name better because it yes. now reminded me of Heidegger's unnamed gods. Yes. He doesn't yes. name them because he doesn't want to give us, oh, look, you should believe in Zeus and Hera. And yes. No, you, we can't go back to Greek mythology. That would be a bit ridiculous. Yes. So they're unnamed for now because this, unfortunately or fortunately, who knows, is uh, an epoch where gods have disappeared, where the godly is disappearing and withdrawing. But what we can still say that there is a flickering, some lingering, some some gloom of them still there, some something that's still there, that's still an echo of the divine. But we can't name it. We shouldn't name it because if because what I don't like about isms is that they are already they're already ossified, right? They're, they're like, oh, yeah. oh, it's already the, it, it, I'm I'm this ism and that's it. So this is what I this is no. But, if we, because almost that's almost again subjectivity just asserting itself, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm this ism, and therefore everything's fine, and I have to worry about it. No, then that's not the age we live in. We live in the age of for nothing makes sense to some degree, but this is it's this it's the tide is already coming back. There is that it, it's like the Nietzsche speaks of the halcyon tone, right? Of the tone of the halcyon bird, which already uh, hears the. So it, it, the halcyon bird breeds during a two, two weeks of, of uh, or a couple of weeks when, when the ocean is still and, and knows that tempest will come again and it's, um, it, it's, it's prepared for the horror, right. <laughs> the yeah, terror yeah. that's yeah. about to come. But, uh, it's, so it, it, but, it, but it doesn't sort of, what I'm trying to say is this, this way of thinking, philosophia is a good name for it because it's also quite open. Right, um, yeah. but if we if we stifle it with with isms, then we're, it's almost like we, what, what, what would happen is you you can produce a consumer product, right? Uh, I'm, exactly, exactly. I mean, and 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 so part of it I think is actually a bi-directional uh, critique, um, which it, the one we're giving voice to now is um, to try to try to try to resolve this through nostalgia, and that's yeah. that's a deep mistake. I think also trying to resolve this through um, a utopia which has a completed picture of the future is also a deep mistake. I think these things are not the proper framing that we need for what I'm calling philosophia. Well, that, that's the work then that needs to be done, right? That's the, yeah, yeah. Well, not sort of framing all of philosophia, but pr bringing, well, giving birth to philosophia, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> that, it's more about exemplifying and participating in it. Uh, yeah. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, uh, I, I will, of course, theorize it because that's also. Yes, my, yeah, my, that's what we do, yeah. That's my job and my work. <laughs> Step on it and then <laughs> theorize. Well, yeah, kind of, kind of. Yes. But, you know, it's really interesting how hard it is, I mean, to, I, uh, you know, it, it's coming sort of easy for us, uh, but it, it's hard to get people, because often if you say, uh, you know, give up nostalgia, they go, oh, yes, I get that, utopia. Yeah. And you say, or if you say to people, no, no, not utopia, and they go, oh, yes, I get that, nostalgia, right? And it's like, no, 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 no. The, the, the grammar that's generating both of those is what I'm asking you to step beyond. And then that's when there's the glimmer of horror in their eyes, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that's the, that's the moment that requires deep respect of the person you're talking to, deep sensitivity, and, yeah. and, and a willingness to linger and be patient uh, with them. Um, and I and sorry, that came off as condescending, and I didn't mean it to be condescending. I meant it to yeah. be. I meant it to be caring. Yeah. I'm gonna have to go soon, guys. We've been talking for two hours, and I, I foresee that we we could talk for, oh, for yeah, two hours. Without, without without any <laughs> without any difficulty. Yeah. Th this was extremely fruitful. I found this very helpful, and also deeply joyful to participate yeah. in. So thank yeah. you both of you very I mean, much. Uh, thank you very much. I'm horrified thank with all of the both of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm hoping this this is the first of many of these. Yeah. I would like it if I could have. The file of this because I'd like to put the so I'm going to upload uh, the discussion I had uh, with Johannes to my Voices with Verveke uh, site that comes out one uh, Sundays at one and it would be great if I had this as a follow-up uh, to upload. Uh, so I'll send it over to you. That'd be great. 
Yeah. So let's let's let uh, let's keep doing this. Let's meet up yes. again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and let's do this again because um, I I found it extremely valuable. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah. And I just, also, I just want to say that that from my experience of doing these right and putting them up and having people watch them, it these things in themselves is awakening. Right? Yes. Well, totally. Reading. There's just got a like a hero. Invites, right. It, it invites participation. It does. Okay. To do yeah. something, I just want to say that, like, what the very thing that we're talking about is actually, like, actually the thing that, the thing that we're doing in some regard, and just people watch yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Because I've I've heard people talk about like it awakened something in them. Yep, yep. Right? Totally. That's the logos. It's yeah. what what b both what we're explicating and exemplifying are in deep resonance with each other, and they're mutually affording each other. That's part of the logos for sure, for sure. So we will talk again soon, I hope. Again. Yes. Thank, Thank you both very much. Take Thank care, you. Guys. Bye.